cloud. Go. I put it right by it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In the southern kingdom, Judah, there was a new king named Hezekiah. Hezekiah followed God's ways, removing the idols to false gods. The king of Assyria, who had recently taken over Israel, sent one of his commanders to threaten Hezekiah. So Hezekiah went to a prophet named Isaiah for help. Isaiah assured Hezekiah that God would help them defeat the Assyrians. Late that night, the angel of the Lord went through the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 people. Isaiah reminded the Israelites that they were to follow God in all they did. God delivered a promise through Isaiah that a new king and a new kingdom was coming for the Israelites. Through his death, this man would bring peace and a kingdom that would never end. King Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, was only 12 years old when he became king. He was very different from his father, doing all sorts of evil things. He led the people to worship false gods. Things got so bad that God brought the Assyrian army against Manasseh. They put a hook in his nose and led him away to the city of Babylon as a prisoner. In his suffering, Manasseh humbled himself and prayed to God. God allowed Manasseh to be set free and return home. For a few years, things began to improve, and the Israelites began to follow God again. They even discovered the book containing all of the laws of Moses, which had been lost for many years. The people learned once again what it was like to live in God's ways. But soon, things got much, much worse. The kings who ruled over Judah once again led the people away from God. Then one day, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, attacked the Israelites, nearly destroying the temple Solomon had built. He captured almost all of the Israelites, including the best warriors, workers, and artists, and sent them to battle. Only a few of the poorest Israelites were allowed to stay to take care of the fields. God sent two prophets, Jeremiah, to those left in Jerusalem, and Ezekiel to those living in Babylon. Unfortunately, the news was bad. Because they had done so much evil, God allowed the city of Jerusalem, their home, to be almost completely destroyed, and the rest of the Israelites sent to Babylon. But the prophet Ezekiel told the Israelites living in Babylon that God would not forget about them that God would one day rescue and restore them. God even gave Ezekiel a vision that he was standing in a valley full of bones. There was a rattle and a sack, and the bones began to come together, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and they came to life. God told Ezekiel the meaning of the vision. These bones and the whole house of Israel, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am God. Uh, <laughs> then, um, uh, all right, let's do a uh, um, break up into groups of twos and threes and just talk about the chapter real quick. Uh, we'll take five minutes or a little less if possible. You two okay. here. I'm gonna do something. Sure. Do you guys want to talk? You need to get on off mute. <laughs> You're on mute. There we go. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. How about you, Barb? You're on mute. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> okay. um, the thing I thought at first about this chapter was I didn't realize that there was two different times 
that they were exiled into a Babylon or wherever. For some reason, I thought the Israelites and from Judah all went at one time. But I guess obviously that's not true. <laughs> so that kind of confused me a little bit. But uh, it seems like it was the same old story. You know, they weren't <laughs> behaving. They weren't behaving. They were, you know, not doing well and just decided to, you know, okay, nothing's going to happen to us. God isn't looking. So we're just going to do whatever we want. So I thought it was, uh, in a way, I don't know why they thought they weren't going to be punished. <laughs> I mean, because they were so, you know, off the, you know, the regular off path. The path. Yes. Yeah, the temple was not even the temple anymore, you know, which was God's temple. And it wasn't, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think they knew. Maybe some of them didn't really understand who God was, you know, especially if you're brought up in that, you know, evil way. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes it seemed to me that God really waited a long time before he interfered. <laughs> yeah, he gave him yeah. every chance. He gave him every yeah. chance. And gave them a chance. And it, it's the same old story of all the kings. Yeah. It just seems like, uh, you know, nobody. And, and to have a king when he's eight years old. Now, how did that happen? Um yeah. Well, there must have been the, the advisors were the ones that were really ruling the kingdom. And yeah. it seems like they were by the old, the old rule of the kingdom. Right. right. Somebody knew. And so, uh, but I think when God finally approached them, he meant business for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't think they ever really believed it would happen until it did you know like when, until they actually were in siege by you know and then all of a sudden they wanted god to help them and it's like no i'm gonna let this happen because y'all deserve it <laughs> i guess and it, seems I, like, it seems like that's the way it is today i'm uh, this brought to mind um the twin towers in new york city that were bombed Mm -hmm. And after that, the churches were full. Right, right, right. And it seems like there's always a catastrophe of some kind that brings people back to the kingdom of God. You know, they're, I think, I think they're always there, mm -hmm. but not really the serving, you know? And then all of a sudden it's, wow, we, we need to get back. Right. So. I agree with you. What do you think, Barb? Yeah, I, th I think that's true, too. I, I think it's, you know, it sounds like being a parent. Oh, you're yes. not really going to punish me. I'm going to count to three. You've got till three. <laughs> <laughs> At three, you get time out. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess God put trust in them that they would finally see the light. Um, but then when they didn't, he had to interfere, otherwise the whole, the whole kingdom, the whole world would just be evil. So. All right, let's bring the groups back together. We had a good conversation online. Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the kingdoms fall. Uh, a lot to cover today uh, as we navigate through this, but let's start off with your questions, comments, concerns, curiosities. We were asking the question, why did God wait so long so many times before he, he interfered? I think probably he was trusting that maybe they'd come around, but finally, you know, there, he didn't have much hope in, in the human race. So then he, he did interfere and came like a bolt of lightning to them. Yeah. Um, 
you could say that like God gave a bunch of chances every once in a while his hopes got up there was some good kings that were thrown in there you thought ah maybe they'll turn this ship around you know uh, and then he realized nope nope we're not doing that because every thought every one of the kings he did evil they did evil in the eyes you know and they all start with it they did evil in their eyes <laughs> a, a lot of them right uh you have Josiah who, and Hezekiah. Who are, Hezekiah's fatal flaws. He wants to show everything off, right? He shows the Babylonians everything. And then uh, Josiah, he finds the books. Mm -hmm. But then between them, you have Manasseh. Not good. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the worst. And all his sons and sons and grandsons. And yeah. What you'll realize in uh, in uh, for Manasseh um, is that what, what he got down to was passing sons and daughters through the fire, which meant child sacrifice. Yeah, he's the one that killed his own kids. Yeah. And so if you read in there, uh, Josiah, one of Josiah's things that he eliminates the possibility for that. Tears down the structures that Manasseh had made for that thing to happen. Now, any other questions or thoughts about the chapter before we dig into it? No, for the most part, it's pretty generic. He did evil. Well, that's kind of a flaw. It's a good question. What? How do we define what is evil? You, you can define it. Right. So God isn't in the business of just kind of. Um, what do we call this now? Uh, whatever is your evil is your evil. Whatever is your good is your good. God has a definite structure that's set up between what is evil and what is good, right? Most of it, their evil was they didn't follow God. They worshipped idols. other idols. Yep. So what is evil is really turning away from God. Right, it's not right. Uh, following God's precepts or looking to God uh, as their God, instead they like to follow other ways. When did they lose the books? I, I mean, I always thought they always had the law of Moses, and then it said that the one king found found them again. I'm like, where have they been, and when did they lose them? Yeah. And then the stories go down from generation to generation about what the law of Moses was. There's a lot that's uh, packed into that, right? Because you have uh, you have an oral culture for the most part, right? Um, but things were written down. You have stuff that's been written down, right? Not much. Um, and so uh, it's not determined exactly like when they lose them, but the fact that there were evil kings that chose to bring in all sorts of other gods it could have easily been in that spot and some faithful person buried them away. There's the question that comes in as well about when the books of Moses were written, actually written down. Were they written down before the kings happened or were they passed orally and then when things got rough, somebody decided let's write them down, right? Now there's a tradition that says Moses wrote them down. Of course, Moses dies in Deuteronomy. That makes it a little bit more challenging to write down, but... But the answer to that is that Moses had a vision and knew exactly what was going to happen. So he could just wrote that piece down, which would be more scary than anything else. So if you knew when you were going to die, that's... What are the books of Moses? Oh, I mean, there's first five books of the Bible. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is what they count as the first five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At least I've never heard of it as the... Are the five books of Moses. What's the word? Pentateuch. Five... First five books, Penta. Uh, that's why we come. <laughs> every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. And so they find that which contains then the law, right? And the law is their relationship with God. So if they haven't been following the law, they've been following whatever, then it is like trying to live to that law it would be tough. Or they get to follow whatever law that they so choose, right? right? So it becomes, again, a thing of relevance in, in terms of where you're at. 
So our law could just continue to change without having the scriptures. We don't have a basis to kind of pull us back into, right? To let God continue to speak. Uh, that word will change and evolve, um, could change and evolve into whatever God of that day uh, seems best. Um, and that's, you know, the church is constantly pulling and pushing on that very nature. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give time to online. Anybody online that had something that they... Yeah. <laughs> no? Agreeing with what's being discussed. Okay. Um, drove past <clears throat> Lord of Life Lutheran Church. Yeah. And they have a sign that says, New Year, New Beginning, Same God. Oh. And so I was just thinking, well, that sort of fits in with what we're doing because we're talking about God speaking to us. And it's the same God. Does he tell us the same thing? Uh, I just thought that same thing. Same things, and we still don't listen right. the same way, right? <laughs> you know, like, and the, oftentimes that's the conversation. If you if you start to think through, because we're now in chapter seventeen, what's the theme that we you know, and start to think the themes that we are pulling out. The major themes. One of them is. Pay attention to what God has to say. Listen to the words that God has to say. Right? I think I would find that because of my um, skeptical nature sometimes, I would find it harder because I think of the, of the guys on the speed corner that are prophesying, you know, and saying, you know, God, this and this and this. When now, when living back there and you've got Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and talking, you know. I wonder how, what the difference is why you wouldn't think those people were nutcases. Right, we're crazy. Mm -hmm. How do we know somebody is a nutcase even now? Right. Well, you look at the geniuses of people who are saying, well, eventually we're going to tie the cords together and we'll all be connected on these computers and we'll be able to do all of this sort of stuff. And people thought, Right. You know, uh, um, last night I was just listening to uh, a podcast on the Branch Davidians. You remember that? We're on the 30th year of the Branch Davidians. David Koresh, mm -hmm. where the ATF blew up their building and everything. You don't remember this? It was in Texas. It was down well, in Waco, my Texas. Was I was raising a kid. And I don't follow the news. <laughs> it's one of it's one of my earliest memories that I have of uh, was it in Waco? It was in Waco, oh, yeah. I did outside of Waco. Yeah. For fifty one days, the Branch Davidians, which were a, a division off of the Seventh Day Adventists, held up in a special compound that they had built, um, and um, they fought ATF. Um, and, um, it was a battle of kind of two people who don't really care about each other. The, the branch of Indians thought that they were doing on nature of whatever God has told them. And the ATF thought that they were just a bunch of whack jobs. And, uh, instead of trying to figure either of them trying to figure it out, it's all out war until they rammed the tank. You remember this? They rammed the tank yeah. into the side. Yeah. And then they put a bunch of that uh, tear gas in there, and then the tear gas caught fire and blew the whole building up, killed 23 kids. It was terrible. I mean, that was. I forget what was the. I forget the reason that they were even there. It was Crash did something. Oh, yeah. Crash was selling. He was, yeah, something. he was selling semi automatic weapons. He was turning them into okay. automatic weapons and then yeah. selling them. That was why they. And there was a rumor that he was going to. Like part of their going to heaven thing was that he was gonna, they were just gonna go start attacking people in Waco until they got killed because that was their ultimate goal was to be killed. No, I thought there was something too about the children there. Right. Either they were being molested yeah. or they were like in danger. They were all married to him, a kid yeah. or a girl. And uh, yeah, they, they sent the people up there. Of course, it's, it was tough. 
I mean, there's a there's a lot that's kind of come out of it in terms of um, how we operate around cults and things along that nature. But were there survivors? Mm -hmm, nine, all men, all adults. That they were all burned, but they they got out. Crash and a sidekick. They they died in the fire. He well, but he was shot. And then the other guy is a suicide, suicide. Well, it was a murder, suicide, but it wasn't. So I also listened to a podcast. It was American History Tellers, and the the main source from the story was another FBI agent who was negotiating with him. Mm -hmm. And this guy felt that he was making progress, and he eventually could have gotten the kids out if the other ATF people hadn't stormed in. Yeah, there's two different teams. There's a negotiating team and a tactical team. And the tactical team just thought, well, they're just dragging us out forever. Mm -hmm. And it was like 51 days. It was on the news every night. This is how I remember it. Yeah. I, re I remember it being on the news. I remember the tank going in. And and I remember it blowing up or turning on. Like, well, they had, they had a lot of um, weaponry and firearms there, too. Right. They had so a whole the explosion arsenal. was, they, they both uh, contributed to the explosion. Right. So the gas caught on fire, which then blew up the arsenal yeah and yeah it's i mean and it's there's some crazy stuff but both every side of that coin said this wasn't done right at all um you know when was this 90s this is 30th anniversary janet reno was the uh, janet, janet reno not that she was part of the story she, she was she, she had to give she gave the final approval well, she wasn't in contact, but I did. Okay, yeah. She was the one that said that it was okay to put this CS gas, which is like a form of tear gas, mm -hmm. into the, it was supposed to create a bunch of irritation, but it wasn't supposed to catch on fire. Well, they put too much of it in. They loaded all of it in there at the same time. They were going to put like one can in there every so often, and then it wouldn't catch on fire. Turns out it did. We learned something. Probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You know, we're no, lucky. We're, we're lucky today that we have a democracy. And you know, in those days, if whoever was king, you just had to listen. Yeah. Or else hide, in the, hide in the bushes, you know. But today, the public can be aware. Of what's going on because there's a lot of evil going on and through our our voting for our our uh legislators um we have some say mm -hmm. and yeah. hopefully that we put people there that approve of the way that god wants them to uh, be in that uh role yeah it's, a, it's a, you know, instead of having uh, a bloodline determined leadership, we actually get to pick people who we think are leaders. So. Right. And I think it's it's easy for a lot of people that have issues in their lives to follow somebody who promises things that really are not true. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, so, it's e easier to make up things, right? Right. <laughs> All right, uh, so we have uh, um, we have kind of this beginning is is basically the same historical narrative for the first couple uh, chapters, right? You have all sorts of things that are going on, and what I what I think is helpful as you navigate this chapter is to kind of uh, take a more ten thousand foot approach of looking at it. So instead of trying to figure out like the details and like that, it's trying to lead us somewhere. The overall theme of it is that everything starts to devolve, right? Things are not going well. Even when they seem like one generation comes good, they're not going well. But they haven't been going well. <laughs> well, so yeah, I mean, it, it, so it, that's from our that's world. Out of tree. <laughs> that's, yeah, since out of um, and so, I mean, we're down to things that are kind of 
uh, wild, like an eight-year-old king. Like I have an eight-year-old. There's no way <laughs> anything, um, especially a boy. Right. And uh, then you have uh, a, a king that lasts only three months, and you have Josiah who does all sorts of great stuff. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of different pieces, and that's it's just one king after another who, who you know, doesn't get it right, essentially. One of the ways I think that's best to view this chapter as is if you can remember back to 2020 in March, when all of a sudden we were told that we were not allowed to leave our houses for anything. Church was closed, school was closed, everything was starting to close, and uncertainty filled the air. We were, um, you know, for a good solid two weeks, at least in Georgia, we were pretty good about staying home. People were helping each other out, and you can't interact with even your neighbors. It was uh, maybe if you're outside, and there was always hope that this is, you know, after these two weeks, it's all going to be done. Wasn't. And then Easter came and went. And then the school year ended and the kids never got to go back to school. And the summer started and we thought, oh, well, we'll be fine in the summer. And then the cases continued and we were starting. And I don't know what y'all did here at Prince of Peace, but we were in church, but distanced and not in church at all. Closing, opening, closing. It uh, felt like the greatest yo-yo. You'd plan all this stuff and then you'd have to shut it all down because cases spiked and the governor would come on in Georgia and no gatherings. Like, that was our reality. We were able to open back up by the time Christmas came around. We had to have seven Christmas services that year uh, in order to accommodate everybody. We didn't, we didn't two. do any of that. We didn't have a service where we saw each other till Easter outside. Um, and we only had one Christmas day. Right, it was, on, it was that first year. Yeah, we did, I, I did a little differently. I taped the sanctuary and made six foot circles. And that we would, you would sign up as a pod and the pods would go into the sanctuary masked, no singing, um, but you could come in. And we did seven worship services and fogged in between each of the services. So it was, it was quite an ordeal, but, and then we did take home kits too. So you could come in and get all your stuff. And then we streamed one of the services. Um, we had take home services. We had take home communion. Yeah, we had take home. I did, made little candles, and we made little packs for the kids and um, communion and everything you come and get the bulletin. That was a big thing for a lot of people. They Jeremy turned into a producer and mm -hmm. he figured out he had a mini choir yeah. that was families and they put together a service every week that was really very good. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Yeah. We yeah. didn't do any Bible studies except through Zoom kind of thing. Yeah. everything was either online or it didn't happen yeah you couldn't do it so if you remember back all the way back to uh when this started and that and that's a kind of a good head space to be in when you're reading this chapter right when you're in a space where everything is like uncomfortable unfamiliar and you don't like it at all and all you want to do is go back to the way it was not like bruce springsteen like glory days but like going back just to even the chaos that existed in your life, because that at least you knew, right? right. And this is not what you know. And so you long to go back, right? And that's really the exile, the, and the exilic texts were helpful in the midst of the beginning of the pandemic, because it wasn't like the first time that anybody's ever done this before, even though it felt like our first time. And we didn't know how to deal with the pandemic, but we knew what exile was like. And so as Christians, we could talk and speak into that space of being in exile in a foreign space. Maybe not a country, but in a foreign space altogether. And so here, the exilic texts are really helpful to, to be in, in a space whenever you feel like you're in that. So maybe move into a new space, and it feels like everything is new. Everything is different. The customs are different. The way about being is different. 
where the milk is in the grocery store is different. And uh, everything is different in that front, right? And, and so here we get a vision of two different prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, right? Ezekiel is smart. We know this because he gets taken. So the Babylonians sweep in and they take all the best of the best, you know? This was a time you didn't want to be picked for the team, right? Uh, they came in, they took all the people that they thought would be helpful and everybody who they didn't think was going to be helpful. You just get to stay back, do whatever you want to do for the first wave. The second wave then comes in and takes every. We, turns out we need everybody. Come on. Um, and they, they sweep them up and they take them uh, all again. But in page 235 uh, in the story, there we're at, uh, we see the beginning of the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is a wild book, kind of like an acid trip. Uh, you are taken to all different kinds of places. And it's like, it's, uh, there's tons of visions that are in uh, Ezekiel. And if you're looking for some good gospel music, tune into the charioteers. And listen to all their uh, good old style kind of barbershop quartet, but good music. And a lot of it comes out of Ezekiel and these kind of prophets um, um, because spirituals oftentimes can't, came from a place to give us hope, right? That was their goal was to give hope. And so Ezekiel ultimately, while it names a bunch of things, is a book that tries to give us hope. So here we go. From the beginning, we are in uh, in this uh, in my thirtieth year, in my fourth month, fifth day, while I was in the exiles by the river Kibar or Kibar River. The heavens opened up, and I saw visions of God. Now, here's a little thing to note: um, from Numbers and Deuteronomy, we know that you couldn't become a priest until you were thirty, and to, and then through your fiftieth year. So for 20 years of your life, you could become a priest. Now, that sets the whole tone of this book. Because imagine your whole life, you have been waiting to be able to do this. You've been trained, you've been told from a very young child, you're going to be a priest in the temple. You're going to get to do this someday. Think about how that feels then as you get to this spot and it's not happening. And I think that Ezekiel then not only helps out in pandemics, but it helps out in our own lives when, when it's not turning out the way we thought it was going to be, right? You know, uh, as a little kid, you imagine at this age, you're going to be married and have your two and a half kids and uh, a dog and a sustainable job that gives you meaning in life, right? And then uh, as you get older, you start to imagine you're going to have uh, you know, life is going to be uh, settled down at this point in time. It's chaotic now, but eventually it's going to settle down and you're going to have, you know, stability and you're not going to have to worry about calling the heating and plumbing person every other month because everything breaks in the house. And this isn't the American dream. Um, or you get up to retirement phase or you end of your career and you think in retirement, I'm going to get to do all this stuff. And then disease and doctor's appointments and the, the process of aging happens, right? And it turns out that it's not that same sort of way, right? This visions that we have cast for our life and they don't turn out. And this is where Ezekiel is at as well. And you maybe have known one or a living one um, and that's uh, where we come into this book. So imagine again, you're in exile, your life isn't turning out to be exactly what you want it to be. And uh, here we are in, uh, in the midst of it. So the very first vision then that Ezekiel has is this vision of all sorts of things. It's like uh, there's wheels and there's these four-headed creatures and there's this guy who's sitting on that and there's radiance around him. Uh, who is who is who is it? It's God, right? And uh, and it says the appearance 
Uh, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory. Now that uh, word glory in Hebrew is actually kavod, K-O-V-O-D, kavod. And that, I only say that because it will have importance down in the left. But it's the same word that was used. Kavod would be the same word that the glory of the Lord is up on the mountain with Moses in Exodus, right? The glory of the Lord is something that we will understand um, we interpret it as like a smoke or something like that, but it's oftentimes means like heavy or important, uh, kavod, um, uh, has a function into the future. So, so Ezekiel here sees the kavod of God, glory of the Lord. No, no, he sees the appearance of the likeness. Of the kavod of God, right? The reason why is why in the world is God in Babylon? Where should God be? Jerusalem, Jerusalem at the temple. temple. So what does Where it mean is that made? God then has now in this vision showed up in Babylon into this place where he doesn't want to be and is not his own homeland into a time in his life when things are not going the way he wants to be and yet the first vision he has is God showing up. God then makes him a prophet, and Ezekiel does goofy things, right? Also, when you see the term there, son of man, should really be translated mortal. Uh, it's not talking about the same thing as Jesus. Um, that I wanted to note that it's more of a Bible study thing than anything else. But, um, right. We're not, we're, uh, the idea there isn't, isn't, the same they're not the same concept it's a translation error um that really should just be mortal and if you i think if you read in the rsv you should have some of that same anyway lots of crazy stuff happens he makes ezekiel makes up a little like makes up a little town and then like godzilla's it like you're gonna be destroyed Jerusalem, and then uh, he like binds himself up and eats food only cooked over poop for a while because you're going to be out in the. I mean, uh, Ezekiel's a while you see in the that act, case, he's that's a that trip, case. right? I mean, it's a good the guy. Is, yeah, we're not paying attention to this, <laughs> right? Why would you, right? And yeah, so there's some really fun things that he decides he likes to do. Um, uh, yeah. So the word of the Lord comes to me and says, oh, mortal, set your face. Uh, um, that interesting. I just found the exact verse we we're at. So this is this right here on page 236 is uh, chapter 6 in, um, in Ezekiel. Uh, but it says, it, in there it would say, oh, mortal, set your face toward the mountains of Israel. Um, so uh, um uh, again that's a translation uh thing although you know as long as you're aware of it and that's not jesus thing um so ezekiel does all this sort of like goofy uh crazy stuff and um they don't listen to it shocker <laughs> and uh you know it may seem goofy to us now uh, you know but they, uh, I don't know if they saw it as the same thing. Um, they just enjoyed what they had and they didn't want to change their ways. And so eventually God says to them, disaster, unheard of disaster, see it comes. It's not a thing, whether it comes, it is coming. So then we move to, oh, go ahead. He kept reminding them not to be afraid. You know, we've heard a lot in that of that phrase in the Bible, do not be afraid. Yeah. And, and listen. Yeah. Now we go to Jeremiah. Have you? Uh, so Jeremiah was not one of the lucky ones that got taken away to exile. Instead, Jeremiah is a prophet that is in Jerusalem. And he prophesies in Jerusalem. He's a boy at the beginning. Um, and he uh, eats the scroll that tastes like honey. I remember that. Um, 
piece of it. He's young, so that's a really uh, fascinating aspect of it and has a very similar message to those who are still there. Like this, uh, this you need to shape up or things are gonna change, guess what? Um, that they come back and they get everybody, right? I think he goes off to like uh, Egypt, somewhere like that. And um, anyway, Jeremiah is known for several different pieces of Jeremiah. There's uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, right? Somebody has that on a sailboat in their picture in their house probably, because that's common uh, to see that one. That's one of the more common we have. Uh, um, the Jeremiah is the, pro, is the Old Testament lesson for Reformation Day all the time, 31-31, that uh, um, uh, I will make a new covenant for you, not like the old covenant, one that I led you by the hand out of the land of Egypt. Right? But this covenant will be written on your hearts for all will say, uh, or none will say, know the Lord because all will know me. You know that mm -hmm. part of Jeremiah, that's, uh, the text that we had from last week, I will make you fishers of men. That's Jeremiah 16, 16. Uh, God will cast out his fishermen to collect his people. Now, how does God do that? Uh, they don't fish with like lures, right? It's not a rod and lure type of thing. It's a net, right? He's going to cast out his people to gather them back in. Also, God talks about his hunter going out too. So that's a little different story. Um, uh, same, same chapter. Um, but all of this is kind of continuing to move them along here. Um, and on page 243, so Judah went into captivity away from her land. Right. So there they are. They are gone, right? And I think that's just the overall. Um, they did, it was weird, weird things. And weird things keep happening. Like the last king of in chapter in the chapter in Second Kings, the last thing that happens in Second Kings is that the the king, the the to be king of Israel, is actually released from prison, brought up to Nebuchadnezzar's table, and there we should eat together. And then like the chapter ends, it's really weird, right? There's a lot of goofy things that kind of happen in the midst of of this, but um, that's. That's where we're at. So Jeremiah, Israel is done. Judah is done. Their Assyrians and the Babylonians have conquered them. They are in exile. Everything lays waste. There's a few folks that got to stay back because we'll find that out when we go back. Uh, but they, they leave from uh, praising and serving God and they start to serve other gods and they mix uh, with, with those folks. So on 243, on page 243, we move into the beginning of Lamentations. So that section is an acrostic. It's a Hebrew acrostic following the alphabet um, of Lamentations. And Lamentations is a book that most folks probably haven't spent much time in. Um, but it uh, uses imagery to just talk about how painful something is. I think one of the things can be hard when we're in the midst of a painful situation is that we lack words. We don't always know what to say, right? We know we have feelings. We feel them. We're not exactly sure if our words can properly express how we feel. Lamentations might put words, Psalms do this too, might put words to those feelings that you have. And so reading through the book of Lamentations in a time that things are tough, uh, can be helpful. You can see this. See how she's like, a, uh, how like a widow is she? Who once was great among the nations. She was queen among the provinces and now is a slave, right? You just hear this language. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. This, this, this language that feeds into uh, how hard it is. This is Lamentations 1. So uh, that's in our book here. Um, and so you, you can get that, just this honest language about how things are. It finishes in the story here is, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return 
and renew our days of old as if we can just turn back the dial and things can be like they once were. And that's not possible. I think for us, as we navigate COVID-19, it's not possible to just go back to the way things were before. Do we know who wrote the limitations? I don't, I don't know. Um, not one of those, not Ezekiel or Jeremiah. No, because it's more like poetic in its nature. Um, okay. You can look at that uh, in here afterwards. Um, it, uh, um, and find out who they attribute it to. We move back now to Ezekiel, and this is probably, if you knew anything from Ezekiel, you knew this last section, right? So the way Ezekiel finishes out uh, his acid trip is that there are three sections. One is a concerning Israel. One is concerning the nations, and one is concerning all of creation. And then he wraps back around, and these last three sections are hope for Israel, hope for the nations, and hope for all creation. He uses stories to emphasize each of those. So it's kind of a nice way to like end your vision, um, because he kind of does that parallel, right? that supporting parallel. And so uh, it says uh, in chapter, or in 246, uh, about halfway down, we read in this. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord, and, he, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Why is it full of bones? <laughs> yeah, it's like the elephant graveyard in the lion cave. They're all gone, right? And... Um, it's a representation of those who die, not only on the way in the battles, but also on the way and those who die there. Um, he led them back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, and they were very dry, which means they were Long dead. old. Old bones. Old bones are dry bones, right? So if they're if these bones are hanging out for a while, they dry out and they go into powder. Um, and he asked me, Oh mortal, can these bones live? Now God's asking you a question. Best way to respond is I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Keep that in the memory banks if God's asking you a question. Do not try to answer. Right? <laughs> Pro tip here, there's uh, Ezekiel is giving you a little bit of a heads up there. And that's the best way to go back at it, right? <laughs> Just give it right back to God and say, I don't know. I'm not even going to try, right? Uh, and so there it is. And so then uh, God says, to them, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That is what the sovereign Lord says to the bone. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons and you will make flesh and come upon you, cover you with skin. And I will put my breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded and as prophesying. There was a noise, a rattling, the sounds of bones coming together, bone to bone. I looked, tendons and flesh appear on them. Skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, O mortal, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied and he commanded me. And the breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. And he said to me, O mortal, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. 
I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done, declares the Lord. Here we, here's a lot of language that we have here, but what is the dry bones kind of re-symbolizing? Something that's happened before. I didn't understand the question. What is, what is this symbolizing that has happened before? Wars, probably. Way Wars. back at the beginning. Evil. Garden. The garden before the Garden of Eden. Creating the universe? God created people and then he breathed life into them, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, re a recreation. Then we are a resurrection people. This story, as much as any story, is a reminder to us. Uh, that when we feel like this, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, and we are cut off. There's God. You know, he has left us. We have done nothing in this, and when we're left out to dry, we're dead, our hope is gone, we don't have anything left. Here, God breathes new breath into them. And this is a great story to kind of have in your back pocket when you're when you're saying some of those same things, maybe not the exact same line, you're not talking about your bones being dried up, but I, I complain about my knee quite a bit. But uh, other than that, um, you know, what I'm talking about is like when you feel again, like Ezekiel here, but God is here to give hope and to breathe life and new breath into you. As much as God is talking about this to those who are in Israel, God's talking to you as well about wherever you're feeling dry, your bones are, are dry, here comes the Spirit of God to give you new life. And in that new life, you have hope, right? And you are connected and not cut off. So uh, keep that in your back pocket as you navigate in this time of COVID, as we understand all of these different pieces of the puzzle that are coming together, here we go. Uh, God is making this statement to you as well. Any thoughts or questions? All right. That brought a lot of hope to that chapter. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of hope in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, we just oftentimes get caught up in the details of the, the things that aren't good. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Tim, 